Professor Jerry Z. Mueller, in your book, Capitalism and the Jews, you write that discussions of Jews and capitalism touch upon neuralgic subjects. What do you mean? Well, capitalism itself has often been a neuralgic uh, project. It is, after all, a process that is a central one in the modern world. Uh, it's one that proceeds by what Joseph Schumpeter called uh, creative destruction. So it's constantly innovating, creating new products, new ways of marketing things, new ways of life. And in the process, it's destroying older ways of life and hence uh, both attracts people and is sometimes a, a source of resentment. Uh, the Jews have been intimately connected with the history of capitalism uh, in a variety of ways, both in the ways in which people have thought about capitalism and in the actual practice of capitalism. So when it comes to the way in which people think about capitalism, one of the interesting themes is that uh, I found that when pre-modern thinkers thought about commerce and especially about finance and money making, they often connected it with the Jews for reasons that had to do with uh, uh, deep historical reasons of the role of Jews as uh, financiers and as money lenders and in general as merchants in the Middle Ages. And then often enough, I found when I was writing an earlier book called The Mind and the Market about capitalism and modern European thought, that uh, these, the way in which modern intellectuals thought about capitalism was often related to the way they thought about Jews. And then there was the fact of that when Jews, because of their commercial background and for a number of other factors, for a number of other reasons, uh, when Jews found themselves in situations in the modern world where they had a modicum of equality of legal opportunity, they tended to do disproportionately well in capitalist societies. And that in itself became a neuralgic point because in some cultures, especially those that were suspicious of commerce uh, or where it was felt the Jews were doing better than others, it sometimes led to envy and resentment. And especially in the wake of the Holocaust, Jews themselves, while they thought uh, amongst themselves about this issue of disproportionate Jewish achievement under capitalism, tended to uh, downplay it, tended to not want it to be a subject of publicity or of scholarly inquiry. So while before the Holocaust there was a lot of Jewish historiography on this issue of capitalism and the Jews, in the decades after the Holocaust there tended to be less of it. Then in, in recent years there's been a kind of renaissance of historiography on the role of Jews in capitalism and the relationship of capitalism and the Jews and some of that I tried to bring together. So, so the neuralgic point then has to do with uh, the salience of Jews in the history of capitalism and the fact that their disproportionate success was sometimes a source of envy and resentment. So it was, some, so it was regarded by many people as a subject that only anti-Semites would want to think about. But in fact, of course, it's a subject that since history of capitalism is a, a central theme in the modern world and, and since it's impossible to understand the modern history of the Jews without thinking about their links to the history of capitalism, it's something that as scholars and as, as educated people uh, we ought to take a, an interest in and also it leads into a lot of larger questions about achievement under capitalism that we can get into if you like. Something you explore, is there a stereotype of Jews and capitalism? Uh, there, is a st there are stereotypes, sometimes positive ones, uh, sometimes negative ones. Uh, uh, the association of, because Jews were often connected with uh, merchandising and with finance, and because of their disproportionate economic success, sometimes they were regarded as greedy or materialistic, uh, especially by those who may also have been greedy and materialistic, but we're doing less well out of the capitalist process. Uh, so that's one stereotype. Uh, the stereotype of the Jewish banker exercising secret power around the world, which was a stereotype that arose primarily uh, in 19, late 19th century Europe in regard to the Rothschilds, 
then became a characteristic one on the European radical right and in some aspects of the American far, far right as well. Professor Mueller, why have Jews been extraordinarily successful in capitalism? Well, I should say that they haven't always been, but, uh, and, but on average, uh, as I say, when, they've, when they lived in societies that gave them uh, a modicum of equality of legal opportunity, that is, that didn't legally discriminate against their entry into various aspects of capitalist life, uh, they have tended to do disproportionately well over time. Uh, the reason, especially in the in the Western world, but not just in the Western world. Part of that is because of deep historical factors. For a variety of reasons, Jews in medieval Europe and in early modern Europe tended to be disproportionately involved in commercial sorts of activities, even when commerce was a sort of island within a larger non-commercial sea. Uh, they tended to be involved especially as merchants, uh, a small number, but a salient number of them were involved in various forms of uh, lending money and then eventually various forms of finance. Uh, so one reason is because they came with, they came to modern European societies and to American society with a much greater immersion in commercial culture than people who came from, say, more peasant backgrounds. So that's one factor. Secondly, uh, among Jews, you tended to have uh, very high levels of male literacy uh, in societies in which most people were still illiterate. And you, had to, you tended to have a high respect for the written word and for systematic learning. That came ultimately from uh, Talmudic or rabbinic culture, uh, which Jews were expected to uh, try to achieve some mastery of, though only a small percentage were in a position to do so. Uh, but as I say, in societies where most people were illiterate, among Jews you tended to have high levels of literacy, especially among men. And literacy tends to be a prerequisite, really, for engaging in sophisticated kinds of commerce. So that was a factor as well. And then you had the fact that Jews, because Jews had tended to be discriminated against and excluded from many other areas of economic life. I mean, in, for most of the Middle Ages and much of early modern Europe, uh, they couldn't, for example, own land. There were some small exceptions, but by and large, they couldn't. And by and large, they were excluded from uh, craft guilds. So there were, there, while there were Jewish artisans, there wasn't a high percentage of the Jewish population. Uh, and then when they came into Central European societies and Western European societies and American societies where eventually uh, the legal barriers against them declined, there was still the factor of social discrimination, keeping them out of many established areas of the economy. And that led them to look for new economic opportunities. So Jews tended to be often innovators in terms of uh, marketing and so on. And then, if you add to all those factors, uh, the fact that uh, Jews tended to have more international connections than most people. This was especially important uh, in the early modern world, where, for example, in the Spanish and Portuguese empires and in the Dutch empires, you had groups of Jews, uh, some of whom had been forced to convert to Christianity in the Iberian Peninsula, and then settled in various parts of uh, uh, the Iberian coast, the Brazilian coast, parts of the Caribbean, uh, Savannah in the United States, uh, Savannah or Charleston in the United States, uh, Amsterdam and Antwerp, London, and they formed, and that formed the source of uh, international contacts that at some points was important in Jewish history. And even as late as the turn of the 20th century, uh, you had a very interesting circuit of uh, an international circuit of Jews, mostly of Lithuanian origin, who had come from Lithuania to South Africa. Some of them had settled in Paris and London, and they became a circuit for the sale of ostrich plumes, which were very important in fashion at the time. So if you take all those other factors, plus the international uh, connections, and you put them all together, that tends to explain, insofar as we can, uh, uh, disproportionate Jewish success. I suppose there's one other factor too, and that is 